On this week's Wealth Track, are you prepared for the biggest investment change in nearly two generations? Financial thought leader, historian, and bond expert James Grant says we better be. He explains why next on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. We have been living in an extraordinary era, one not experienced in 5,000 years of recorded history. Most of us didn't even know it and have come to believe it is the norm. I'm referring to the level of interest rates. One of my favorite charts of all time shows the history of short and long-term interest rates since 3000 BC. It illustrates that in the last couple of years, we saw the lowest interest rates in five millennia. A more familiar story is illustrated by this chart, showing what yields on 10-year U.S. Treasuries have done since 1900. It gives us a much shorter time horizon, but still a picture of how dramatic the fall in rates has been over the last three-plus decades. This week's guest believes the era of record low rates is finally over. He is the first to admit he has thought that for several years, but today he is even more convinced that the death knell is sounding and that the implications for markets and investors are profound. He is financial thought leader James Grant, the founder and editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer, a twice monthly analysis of all things credit related. It is a must read for many top professional investors, Grant is a financial historian and prolific author. His most recent book is The Forgotten Depression, 1921, The Crash That Cured Itself. Grant has been a vocal critic of the unprecedented stimulus policies implemented by central banks all over the world, particularly by the Fed, and is alarmed by the high levels of debt accumulated by governments, especially since the financial crisis. In a recent grants, he cited one example of the havoc rising interest rates could create in the U.S. alone. The government today pays net interest expense of $240 billion at an average interest rate of 1.8%. At 5%, it would pay $681 billion, $441 billion more than today, and $77 billion more than the fiscal 2016 defense budget. Reason enough to worry. I asked Grant what gives him the confidence to state that the 35-year bull market in bonds is indeed over. I'm not sure if confidence is the word. Um, I have been thinking along these lines for many years, and if I sound as if I'm confident, it's perhaps because of repetition. Um, this is a working hypothesis, uh, but sooner or later these things do end. You know that the story of interest rates, oddly enough, is a story of generation plus length cycles. Uh, stocks don't work this way, commodities don't work this way, but, but uh, interest rates for some reason or other have worked this way for uh, going on 200 years. Um, you know, these cycles sometimes last uh, 20 years, sometimes 30 years. In the case of uh, gilt-edge British securities in the 19th century, the cycle lasted for about 80 years. But I, I, I do think that we have reached the end of this particular it's a glorious ending in a glorious bull market in bonds. Why? Where, where's the evidence? What's telling well, you well, that? Well, I work back from the, the proposition that uh, you are investing at this point with almost a guaranteed loss. Uh, in the backdrop, or not so deep in the background, is the nature of contemporary money. It is uh, an X or an O and a somebody's uh, cloud or hard drive. It's uh, these things, these dollars, these euros, these renminbi are created as if by magic somebody taps on the computer screen without effort. Um, the sum appears on somebody else's computer screen. That's money, all right? Is money no longer a thing? No, it is a concept increasingly. It is a, an instrument of public policy. Money is what the authorities would make it to be rather than that thing which you can touch, gold, silver, what have you, which 
was money for Eon. So that's one fact in the background. Perhaps a more relevant fact to most investors is the utter absence of value. Um, at the peak of the lunacy in 2016, upwards of, what, 14 trillion of sovereign debt, principally European, was priced to deliver a yield of less than nothing. Right. Nominal yield less than nothing. Now, in the long history of markets, <laughs> you are hard pressed to find that particular value proposition. And our mutual friend, Dick Sella, the author of the page turner called The History of Interest Rates, were he, if he were here, he would attest to the fact that never once in 5,000 years of the recorded annals of interest rates has this occurred. Have bonds, had uh, an important number of bonds been priced at this ridiculous level. So, so if when there's there was a no top, val when there, there was no, the, when there was no value, when there was right. less than no value, when the money in which these promises to pay is denominated is itself a kind of a, of a post-modern concept as opposed to a thing, a store of value. When, all, when these stars come into alignment, I say, phooey, which is a, <laughs> a technical term, meaning not for me, thank you very yeah. much. Now, but by way of uh, postscript, I have been saying this uh, for a while. But, no, uh, you, you and, uh, now, and now many it's others. Really, now it's really true, Consuelo. <laughs> exactly. But, but kind of was the key the negative interest rates so of the kind of the height of absurdity? Like yeah, well, that, that certainly, uh, that was enough for me. Or the me. depth of absurdity, I don't know. <laughs> that was enough for me. Right. Um, and, but, but no, these there, things there, there was, there was, an, there, was an, there was an impulse. There was, a, right. there, was a, there was an almost irresistible urge on the part of so many people to buy what was plainly, objectively, uh, from the perspective of the, uh, of the figurative man from Mars, um, a losing proposition. They had to have it. Right. And that kind of, of impulsive investing is, is a sign. We, we know it's not the bottom, right? And it seems to me that um, it, uh, it uh, very nicely fits into my conception of a top. No value, uh, no how and almost certain loss. That, to me, is, uh, is a persuasive set of propositions for a market top. But we could skirt along the top, we could. right, for a number could. of years. Well, there's and, and, a precedent. And I mean, yeah, tell me what the that. precedent is yeah, as a I'll, financial historian that you are. Well, I, I watched the last time this happened. There was a, a bull market in bonds, meaning a long trend of falling interest rates of rising bond prices began in 1920. And it ended in April of 1946. Now, I was not there for the exact low in yields. I was born in July, but my mother told me what happened in, <laughs> in May and June. <laughs> and uh, bond yields uh, scraped bottom at uh, 2.12 or thereabouts, uh, called two and a quarter. And, um, and it, it took them 10 years to get to three and a quarter. 10 years. Wow. So uh, if someone had been around watching our show in 1946, you know, kind of grainy black and white picture and that one of the three channels available then, and they heard some guy, I would have been very young, of course. Um, <laughs> the child prodigy that you were not. Talk, talk, yes. Talking about uh, uh, interest rates uh, right, bottoming. In the and, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they would have been paid not to worry. Right. Because they, however, however the, the way uh, that the path that rates t took then was, was governed in good part by the Federal Reserve, which was continued to suppress them overtly until 1951. Also, the world was looking back at the Great Depression and, and, about the, and looking back. So the, at the Fed was doing that even then. Oh yes, no, yes. It, it had begun in, in the early years of the war, and it persisted until 1951. There was there were explicit pegs for bonds and and for uh, treasury bills. Um, now uh, the pegs are um, slightly less overt. So the it's, role of the Fed then in this. So so I mean, can we assume? That no, this, that <laughs> whatever it is, no. Can we assume anything um, that, that, that this might not be, it's not going to be a sudden, you know, no, I, severe you, ratcheting you, 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 you up of interest it. rates? I, mean, I can swear you can assume exactly nothing. And um, in, in general, that's good advice on Wall Street uh, because there's uh, so much we don't know, like about the future, everything. But in this case, it seems to me it is extra important, this caution about, uh, uh, about presuming to know the future. Uh, if only because of our new president. He is tail risk, so to speak, on two legs. Uh, he says anything, tweets anything. He might do anything. He probably won't do anything. But the range of possibilities mm -hmm. is, is rather mind-boggling. Some of them very, very good for financial assets. Some of them really, really bad. Uh, for instance, it's possible that he will actually implement the thing that he was talking about in the campaign trail. 
Which one? <laughs> well, there were a few, weren't there? Yes, there were quite he a few. Might, he might say that, uh, that uh, no job is leaving the country, and that it could be that uh, corporate America knuckles under to this. It could be that he is going to impose substantial penalties on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on imports. It might be that he's going to I don't know, it, it build the wall, build the darn wall. Right. So all of which would be this would, one, this would, would be part would and be. parcel, perhaps, of the anticipated, although by no means specified yet, mm -hmm. details of this this reflation, this this program of big spending, this mm -hmm. program of government activism. Um, it might be that he appoints some compliant person to be his Fed chairman, who is going to suppress interest rates, in the face of perhaps a rising dollar exchange rate, perhaps. Right. Um, Which some, we're seeing now, a right? Dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. It it might just be that uh, that these uh, that these imagined policies uh, or projected policies of our new right. president will be very very bad for bonds. In which case, uh, the uh, the roadmap we have from the last occasion, mm -hmm. 70 years ago, of mm -hmm. a 10 year rise from two and a quarter to three and a quarter, it could be that's all. It's all out the window. It might right. be it's no longer germane. What might be happening is a very sudden. Uh, rise in interest rates. Uh, we don't know. We, you know, the past is is interesting certainly, and it 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 reminds us what is possible, but it doesn't define what is possible. But to in, invest, you've got to have some sort of a working scenario. You do, right? You do, you do and so indeed. here we are holding, you know, trillions of dollars worth of bonds and personal accounts, and you know, it wasn't until this past year that investors stopped buying bonds and started selling bonds and actually putting money more into the stock market. What do we do in a situation like this with all of our bonds? Well, you ha I, th I think the way to think about this, first and foremost, is, 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 is uh, the value available in these bonds and the alternatives available in other income-producing vehicles. Right. Uh, so uh, last time I looked, the 10-year uh, the Treasury was trading at about 2.5%, which is approximately the rate of inflation that many of us feel in our own lives. Not exactly, because these things are all rather subjective, but about. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, uh, barring a new uh, whiff of deflation and of uh, weakness in business activity, the 2.5% is not a really compelling invitation to invest. Right. And I would say the same for junk bonds, which many of which begin with number five, a yield number five. and. Um, uh, and munis, which, you know, three and four, I mean, these, this is, as we say in the city of New York, meh, meaning quite ordinary and mm -hmm. I think and not... So uh, not attractive not enough, enough not, right. And certainly lacking what the ancients would call a margin of safety. Now mm -hmm. for that, let's, let's go to the, what the stock market can deliver in the way of interest income. Well, there are, there are a mortgage real estate investment trusts that are priced to yield something like 11%. Many of them are trading below book value, which sounds good, and it mm -hmm. is good, mm -hmm. except if short interest rates do go up, there'll be a squeeze between what the mortgage REITs pay to borrow and what they earn on their mortgages, right. and those yields will go down, and the stock prices themselves will go down. So, that, so that's, that, those are the yields, and those are the risks. Uh, there are business development companies that will offer you a floating rate of interest, but they are priced uh, richly, some mm -hmm. of them, the better ones, well over book value. It's an accent, again, because investors have already recognized correct. their attractiveness in a rising rate environment, you want floating rates. Correct, right? and uh, similarly with, with uh, floating rate bank debt. Mm -hmm. uh, senior claims on leveraged corporate capital structures, pretty safe. Uh, they are priced to yield about 4%. Uh, again, yeah, that's okay. Right. Um, may I enter one candidate for consideration? Yes, this company is called Parkway PKY. It is a, it's, it yields nothing at the moment. It is a brand new real estate investment trust that owns properties, office properties in Houston. Now, Houston is a disaster area. Right, because of the fall off in energy prices. Right. right. So much of the office space in Houston is vacant, and one would expect that this would be, on its face, a really dubious investment. Mm -hmm. the, the, the proposition, the value proposition, is that it is relatively cheap. It is at 10 times or so uh, uh, funds from operations. Uh, the average multiple in the world of REITs is something like 17 times. Um, and you feel that Parkway, your analysis from Grant's Interest Rate Observer, is yes. that Parkway can survive its resilient it can, it can, stock. It can survive. And if worth, energy wherewithal. prices, if this reflation idea comes right. to fruition, and if energy prices go up, Suddenly, this, this outfit, which has not very much debt, mm -hmm. has a lot of flexibility in the way it might purchase 
uh, uh, cheap properties in Houston. Right. It, this could be a, a, a really interesting valued stock. So I, this is a, now it's a speculation, and the yield, if one were to surface, the directors might choose to pay you a yield of, say, 3%, which is not anything like the yields available in mortgage real estate tr investment trust. But I think, we think at Grants, that, that there, the upside is, is kind of interesting. It is very speculative. Uh, but so that, that, will be, that, that would be your one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio? Yeah, in yes, way? yes. I, th I, think, I think it's uh, in a world of very, very unattractive alternatives. I think this one is pretty interesting right. on its own merits, not necessarily uh, only in regard to what is out there. To so Jim, with. what that tells me is the, of the paucity of investment opportunities. Well, as I see them, as income, I see them, yes. If plenty, this is kind of all you can come up with, yeah, I mean, I it's, you know. I've tried Consuelo. <laughs> New, a new <laughs> weed in Houston. Okay, um, but really, yeah. So I mean, it's, I, th I think to me, this is the state of financial markets worldwide. Um, my experience is that uh, the best opportunities are prevalent when nobody likes the market in question. Two thousand nine right. was for me. Ah, it was the ah the the the, 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 the smell of, of, of gunpowder or whatever it was. Of, <laughs> or uh, the blood uh, in the streets, the whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I, I am of the value tribe. Um, right. And I'm not satisfied until you can see a margin of safety, until you can see some, um, uh, uh, you know, see investment value that is protected through price. Mm -hmm. So and let, course, let me go back to the to the to the fixed income markets, though, because yeah. um, I mean one of the the issues that you follow at Grants a great deal is the, the indebtedness uh, that we have uh, in this country. In the, the average interest rate of since the inception of America, or the American Republic, was about 6%. That is what the basic kind of prime rate-ish mm -hmm. kind of uh, interest rate has been. What is certainly beneath the average of our interest rate experience is the current cost of the debt, 1.8%. And uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but notice that during the campaign, nobody said nothing yeah. <laughs> about, about this. There, 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 debt. Every other every other topic of interest was covered: uh, 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 sex tapes, um, uh, emails, all the all the <laughs> really pertinent. <laughs> but nobody said a word about uh, about uh, on at least yes. on, the, on, the, on the main presidential base about our fiscal position, which either means it is truly irrelevant, and Mr. Mark, in his wisdom, has chosen to look through it waiting for the time 50 years from now, say, in which it will actually matter, right? or that it's truly significant, and that we all better be paying attention. And that's my call is the latter one. It seems to me that these numbers are truly worrying. Mm -hmm. And um, people say, well, the reason that rates will not go to 5% is because they can't. Look, if they did, we'd be paying debt service equivalent to the, to the defense budget. Now it would be impossible. Right. And I say, right, it would be inexpedient <laughs> if rates went to five, that's, not, that's different from impossible. <laughs> What's going to happen uh, as far as the Fed's role? Again, we, we don't know what, who Trump no. is going to nominate. I mean, he's, he's got several FOMC positions that, that he's, he's, he's going to... He's two now. Two now and perhaps three now. if uh, somebody, yeah. somebody ups and quits. Somebody else, right. You feel that the Fed is way too involved in the economy and way too heavy-handed as it is. Yes. Um, so how much... Does that matter? Well, it matters a great deal. I, okay. I think I, my suspicion is that uh, uh, Mr. Trump will appoint uh, a rather compliant yes, uh, Fed chairman who mm -hmm. will facilitate uh, the program that he envisions for the restoration of greatness in America. He wants to you know, build dams and highways and sewers. Well, right. this will take money. It will take, you know, he's, as he know, well knows as a, as a real estate guy, it will take low financing costs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, so this, my suspicion is that we, he will deliver uh, to the Fed somebody who right. is very much like the people we have known at the Fed. However, there is the, the other Mr. Trump who talked once or twice in the campaign in New Hampshire. I asked about the goal. He said, okay, he said, boy, that'd be terrific. We haven't got enough gold, but what we do. Uh, but there, there is a part in this. You know, he furnishes everything he owns with gold plate. As yes. You know. so, uh, so those of us who... <laughs> through conviction um, or through other, uh, those of us who, who believe in the gold standard, who believe right. in uh, a currency that is grounded in something besides the good intentions of the monetary scholars who run the central bank, take some heart in this. But I think that, I think that the prevailing sentiment uh, the Trump administration will be one for easy money. Speaking of gold, you've been a proponent of the gold standard for many years, yeah. but also you personally own gold. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, uh, the past few years have not been very pleasant, but I do, and I have, uh, uh, what they say in the, in the trade, high conviction. 
And I say this because gold uh, is, is, is on its face, not an investment. You can't quantify its earning power. It has no earning power. Right. A little like Bitcoin, which is quickly overtaking in price to the humiliation of us gold bugs. <laughs> um, but um, uh, gold to me is an investment to this extent. It is an investment, is a hedge against monetary disorder famously. But because monetary disorder is visible, prevalent, and in my perception, growing, I review, review gold as an investment in monetary disorder. It's an investment in the incoherence of these mathematical models that did such a great job, Consuelo, <laughs> of anticipating the sorrows of 2008. It's an investment in the, the controlled anarchy of floating or not so floating exchange rates. There is the, uh, the, the, the ticking time bomb of leverage in the corporate and banking worlds, which leverage is fostered in part by the feds and other central banks' suppression of interest rates and ease of borrowing. So I, 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 re, you know, I, 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 I wish that gold had not been such a dud since 2012, mm -hmm. but I still hold it, have been adding to it because I believe that it's time will come as the consequences of our monetary disorder come to the fore. As of now, people think, oh, they got away with it. They have suppressed, they've, they've materialized $10 trillion in digital script. They have manipulated interest rates. They have jimmied up stock and real estate values. They, they being the Fed. They, the central banks collectively. Yes. And, and it feels great. They did it. Yes. They should have done it before because it is without cost. That is the, that's, is the implicit storyline. But I don't believe that. <laughs> I think these things do have costs, and I think the cost will be forthcoming. So we've had guests on who talk about gold in a portfolio being ballast in a portfolio and being you know, a store of value and that it's, it's, you know, it's basically a non-correlated asset. So when things go bad, yeah. well, gold holds disagree, its yeah. value. But, I don't but, disagree with that. Too. Right. I, yeah. but, but you're talking about it being something more. I mean, so when do you, Jim Grant, I mean, have there been times when you've actually you know, sold gold? When it well, I, 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 I'm glad you asked because I sold some when it got to the point at which I first bought it. <laughs> I, oh, great. <laughs> I, I, I bought it in, uh, in the year 18, it was, no, it was, it was uh, like 1980, and I, and I queued up at a storefront on Wall Street uh, with the other innocents, not then realizing, as now one realized with the wisdom of years, you never stand in line to buy an investment, because well, you always buy no. it when there's no queue. <laughs> yes, yes. So I bought, some, I, I bought some gold. It must have been the peak at 850 or something. And I, I got it. I rude the day where I bought like two Kruger rands, but I felt like such a dope as the years wore on. I, I came to see that what, how interest rates mattered and how valuation matters right. and how gold is a seasonal or is a cyclical commodity sometimes yeah well it, but it, it's, it's money but that. anyway money. i came to see the errors of my rookie ways and i, right. I vowed that if it ever got back to 850 i would sell some so i sold a little bit uh, you know as a, as a symbol as to remind myself of the idiocy of what i was when i was a child of what 30 or something mm -hmm. <laughs> but 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 it, but there's a sec it gives you a sense of security that I mean, is, is that, well, yes, is yes, that it, it and is. that at some point, someone, perhaps your children or your grandchildren, will take your right. stash of gold when well, it's worth a fortune? And you're right. It's it's not it's not an eternal asset, but right. it, it is an asset for a season. So we ha we live in this world of of I say of monetary anarchy, and in such a world, it seems to me, uh, I, I'm not going to say one ought to own gold. I'm going to say that I own. Uh, a little bit of it, right. more than a little bit for myself. And uh, I'm quite comfortable in holding it. Sometimes I, I wish that it would do better for me. Um, but that's different than, than, than losing, than for me, losing my conviction about what it's for. Gold, yes. is, gold is money in a world in which money is being debased and in which it is being trivialized through its ease of materialization on computer keypads. In this world, I think that uh, gold will come back into its own. Gold is, gold is not, it's not exactly out of fashion, but it's sufficiently out of fashion to have reduced the price relative to many other claims on an investor's intention. So I own it and I'm right. happy to do so. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Jim Grant, thank you so much for joining us. On you are so welcome, Consuelo. Nice to be here. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is it's time to avoid leveraged investments. 
If interest rates have in fact finally bottomed, governments and companies with lots of debt will have to pay more, possibly a lot more to service that debt. Case in point is the figure we cited from Jim Grant earlier. If interest rates the Treasury pays on its debt go up from the current 1.8% average to a not abnormal 5%, the yearly interest bill would nearly triple to a staggering $681 billion. Any heavily indebted company or government is facing higher bills and more scrutiny from lenders if rates rise even modestly. It's time to avoid debt-laden investments and favor credit-worthy ones. I hope you can join us next week for our exclusive interview with another financial thought leader. Bank of America Merrill Lynch's chief investment strategist Michael Hartnett will discuss the major investment changes occurring around the world and what they mean for investors. Meanwhile, to hear about Jim Grant's latest project, a biography of Walter Badgett, one of the most influential financial and political journalists of the 19th century, click on the extra feature on our website. Also, thank you for contacting us on Facebook and Twitter. It might take us some time, but we will respond to each and every one of you. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholme Foundation.